Hello, my name is Dr. Freddy's Garcia, and today I'm joined by Dr. David Clark, and we're doing a video case review. Dr. Clark, what's going on today? We are going to be looking at the case of a 21-year-old woman with brain fog, dizziness, and lightheadedness. This is part of our kind of ongoing series called Clinical Neurochemistry and Nutrition in Action. So uh, you want to say any other introductory remarks, or should we jump, jump right into it? No, I think we should jump right into it while we still have their attention. Let's, let's teach them some right, stuff. Let's do it. All right. So we're going to start with her chief complaints, because here's the thing. With every patient we look at, what we're going to try to do is we're going to start with what is their chief complaint? How can we decipher what those chief complaints are telling us? Because what I want to do and what I do in my practice is I look at these chief complaints and I think, okay, is there a metabolic reason that this could be happening? Is there a circuit malfunction reason that this could be happening? Are there, do both of those uh, explain what could be going on? What anatomically can I figure out about this? So here she's got word finding difficulties. Now, what she means by that is sometimes she cannot get the correct word out, <clears throat> although she knows what it is, okay? Other times the word comes out and it's very jumbled and sounds like gibberish. Uh, she has difficulty communicating her thoughts frequently. So let's just think about that. So if you know your neuroanatomy at all, you'll know that if you can't get the correct word out, although you know it, that seems to implicate more of a frontal, kind of a Broca's motor sort of aphasia. Now, if the word comes out and it's jumbled and gibberish, well, that's not motor, that's more of a receptive or a Wernicke's kind of temporal uh, aphasia. So at times she's got both symptoms. So it could be that she's got something going on in that kind of arcuate fasciculus area, that whole area could be the problem. So she says she does have difficulty communicating her thoughts frequently. Now I'm gonna stop there because I don't remember if I've got this in the slides or not. What we're gonna do over this next few minutes is we wanna do a couple things. We wanna understand physiology. We wanna try to develop some clinical decision-making and we're not gonna memorize things, okay? We're not gonna become little clinical robots, okay? We're not gonna do that. We're gonna learn how to think about things. We're gonna learn how to make some decisions. We're gonna learn how to follow up. So that's my little preamble, because I don't remember if I've got it in the slides, my little pretty colors that I have. So I just wanted to say, say that now. So we're gonna understand some physiology, which we just did. We're gonna try to develop some clinical decision-making, meaning what do we do? How do we do it? You know, when do we do it? And then we're gonna talk about um, you know, the protocols, and I hate to use that word protocol, we're not going to say, oh, she has word finding difficulty, then she needs to take B6, because that's not how it works. The body does not work like that. It's just as silly to say, oh, she's got word finding difficulties, I'll adjust her right elbow, because that's what you do for people with word finding difficulties. It is, does not work that way. So this person could have, let's just start here, right? She could have some sort of um, tumor, right? There could be a tumor in the left side of her brain in her dominant language area. She could have uh, some sort of uh, autoimmune disease causing demyelination in her brain. She could have, not because of her age, but you know, she could have, God forbid, some sort of uh, degenerative process in that part of her brain. She could have a dysautonomia where she's just not getting blood to her head, and this is how it's manifesting, right? So there's all kinds of different things that this could be, and you need to be well-rounded, okay, because there is no nutrient that would cause that. There just isn't, that's just not how it works. Anybody ever tells you that, don't believe them because that's just not how it works, all right? Go ahead. You, you, you know, you bring that up and it's interesting. It reminds me of that video where that newscaster had a migraine and this autonomic event had a migraine and then lost her language function. And they yep. thought she was stroking out on video because the words yep. that were coming out were literally gibberish. If you literally yep. saw the language, like be normal and then boom, like. Yep, she's, she, her mouth is moving fluently, but the words are jumbled and garbage, right? Yeah, yeah that's that because was a, that she was, was a migraine. this autonomic event. She was getting blood to her head, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right, so this patient often feels like she is in a haze, as if she took Benadryl. Now, what that means is, is she feels like things aren't clear. What she probably means is she's not thinking very fast. She's not responding very fast. And so there's something going on with, I would say, her ability or the frequency of firing of multiple different areas in her brain. Now, she's not actually sedated. She's not actually falling asleep. She just feels like she's in a haze. If you've ever taken an antihistamine, what does an antihistamine do? An antihistamine, the side effect of it is it decreases the alertness level of your brain, decreases frequency of firing. She often feels dizzy as if the world is moving. Now, the last case we did, we had a guy that said that he had dizziness and the same rule applies here. You always ask them, what do you mean by that? Okay. What she means is if she feels as if the world is moving, right? So she is the center and things around her are moving. 
Sometimes she even loses her balance and even sometimes can fall. That's not good. <laughs> you know, a 21-year-old that loses her balance and can fall because she has some egocentric vertigo, who knows? She doesn't really say it's rotational, okay? Because if it was strictly rotational, that might make, might make us think, as we talked about in the last case, someone has a peripheral vestibular sort of problem. But she definitely has a sense of the world moving. Could be because she's got nystagmus. I mean, we don't know, you know why that's happening. But we know that, it, that the cerebellum is probably involved. The vestibular system could be involved. Cortical could be involved. Because if you guys remember, if you fall, especially if you fall to the side, you could either fall towards the pontomedullary cerebellar sort of area, or you're falling away from the mesencephalic cortical area, right? So if you don't know that, that's in all the 800 series, and I'm pretty sure it's in the RBE series as well. All right, so just with these three bullets, we have a lot of things that are on the radar, right? There's a lot of anatomical areas involved. She walks into things because she, quote, can't see them often with her, with her right side, meaning she bumps with her right side into things because she doesn't see them. But what would that indicate? Well, that kind of matches up with our word finding difficulties if you think about right and left side of the brain, because if she can't appreciate the right half of space, that's probably due most likely to a left parietal lobe sort of a problem, okay? Because that whole kind of map of your body and map of space is represented in that left side of your brain if we're talking about the right side of space. It's possible it could be the right side as well, but more likely it's the left side of your brain. Well, what would cause that? Well, we don't know. I mean, there's not a nutrient like calcium that's gonna cause you to have a parietal lobe lesion. It doesn't work like that. She has headaches. Okay, well, that's a dysautonomic event. Any, any type of headache is always gonna be dysautonomic in, in, in its execution, right? We don't know why she got the headache, but we know that it's a dysautonomic event. She notes that her vision goes black when standing up. Well, that's autonomic, right? Because she's saying if she sits down and stands up, she does not get adequate perfusion to her head, so much so, that she starts to almost black out. She gets a little pre-syncopal. That is an orthostatic event. Now, it could be because she's hypotensive, meaning not enough blood pressure to keep her blood up, or she might be having an escape and have be hypertensive. Because to those parts of the brain, it doesn't matter if the blood vessel goes like this or if the blood vessel just goes like this. Either way, if there's not enough blood getting to the, the neurons, her, her vision's gonna go black. So we have to figure out why, which one is that, right? Now again, hypotensive. Well, there are some metabolic things that I'm gonna think of here in a second, which I'll show y'all. Sometimes if she turns too fast, she loses her balance, okay? Again, this is sounding like a vestibular problem, but we don't know why yet. Her depth perception is off, and she says her vision is often blurry. Ooh, this is a lot of like vestibular sorts of stuff coming together. Now. Depth perception being off, it could be that one eye is actually hyperopic, meaning it's, it's focusing in a different depth plane than the other eye. That could be because she's got an abnormal ocular tilt reaction. She could have some otolithic problems. There's several different things that can cause that. She's also extremely fatigued, even if she has eight to 11 hours of sleep. Well, I mean, there's a bunch of different things that could do that. She could be anemic. She could have a thyroid problem. She could have uh, any number of ATP production problems. She says she has random twitches and her hands are shaky. She gets eyelid twitches and she feels like she has legs that are restless. So here's what she has. Random twitches and her hands are shaky. So do we mean like, like that shaky? Because that's kind of an essential tremor kind of thing, right? Or is it like this? Right? That, that second thing I just showed you, that's what she has. This is an accentuated physiologic tremor, right? It's not really a basal ganglia problem. You get that accentuated physiologic tremor if you have, well, typically you'll find it in people that have hypoglycemia or people that just have problems getting glucose into their tissues. What happens is they start to produce a lot of catecholamines and those catecholamines cause that, right? It's like if you drink a bunch of coffee, right? She drops things all the time. Well, I don't like that either because dropping things, that can mean we have a, a paresis, like an actual muscular problem. It could be we've got a sensory problem, but she says she drops things. She also says, again, kind of a vestibular cerebellar problem. She cannot walk in a straight line. She veers to the right side and she has 
I should put this as a separate bullet because it doesn't have one thing. This, the nosebleeds don't have much to do with her veering to the right side, but there you have it. So what do we got here? Man, we got a lot of stuff if we ask the right questions. So what's on our radar? Well, we just talked about the frontal temporal issue. We've got some kind of vestibular problem, and, I, and I'm including that could be cerebellum, that could be you know all, all the different vestibular connections, not just like peripheral vestibular, although that could be it too. Dysautonomia, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so those are the big things that jump out to me. So what we're gonna have to do is figure out some more. Go ahead. We can go back to that previous slide. What sure. about the um, eyelids? Because, you know, sometimes when you know, the person starts list, listing mm. off restless legs, there are some nutrition deficiencies that can cause some aspects sure. of that. Absolutely. When you go to the eyelid twitches, I start going, all right, well, maybe that is basal ganglionic. So if I, if I had heard basal ganglionic, if I've heard restless legs, those two, I would have said, all right, well, I'm going to examine her basal ganglia, see if there's anything else that accentuates this tremor uh, aside from the neurological. How come that didn't get you to kind of go, maybe well, I should? because she's got this, okay? And since she's got an accentuated physiologic tremor, I can tell you, you can get little eyelid twitches for the same reason. Like I always tell patients that, you know, if your eyelid's twitching, that's usually a sign that you're either stressed out of your mind, right? Or you're not getting enough sleep. So we're not talking about blepharospasticity, right? Or ah. like we're, the, we're talking about like little fine, you know, we get that like little piece here, eyelid. <laughs> I was going to be really weird and show you guys. It's like if like the little piece of your eyelid starts to twitch. So not like, not like the whole lid is twitching, but it's little discrete muscular units, right? That's, that's what tells me that. That restless leg thing that she's saying is probably the same reason. She's just flooded with catecholamines. So she's got all these little kind of, I don't want to say myokymia because that's not the word I mean, but you get little discrete muscular units that twitch. So that, that's why it didn't make me go, oh, that's basal no. ganglia. And you're right, especially when you pair that with the extreme fatigue, even if she sleeps 11 hours, then you go, right. all right, I, I get that. All right, it's making yeah. sense to me now. Of course, good, good question. That's why you should ask. So let's look at her history because that's the chief complaints, but let's see if the history can help us start nailing down some other things because what we've got to do, and I'll tell you guys in a second if you don't already know, we have to start thinking about this in a way that we don't just get lost and just, you know, you know, do a shotgun approach. Like, what do we do? So metabolically, here's what we're looking for. I'm going to kind of steal my own thunder. We're looking for four things. We're looking for GI and liver malfunction, cellular energy problem with glucose or HPA um, axis malfunction. We're looking for cellular energy problems with RBCs and specific nutrients like B12 and iron and folate and that kind of stuff. And then we're looking for clinically significant autoimmunity. I mean, that's the stuff that when we look at her history, those are what we're looking for, okay? Metabolically speaking. Neurologically, here's your, here's your priorities neurologically. Autonomics, like that, that's your big first priority is autonomics. Because look, if you don't get blood to a neuron, it's not going to malfunction because neurons have to have fuel and activation, right? They, and fuel in its most basic form is oxygen and glucose. And dysautonomia means we're not going to get fuel to an area that's supposed to get it. So neurological circuit, brain-based rehab, your primary objective is say, does this person have a dysautonomia? If she does, we gotta figure out why, right? Rather than saying where, what part of the brain is the lesion, like we already know that her left side of her brain is probably the biggest problem, but that dysautonomia is telling you that it may be why she has all of that, okay? So, all right, so history. Uh, 2002, she had a reaction, anesthesia, she had scarlet fever, she had some vomiting and missed some days of school, she had strep throat. 2010, she had a mild concussion from hitting her head on the ground. I just have to take her to her word for that. She had UTI and pneumonia in 2014. 2018, she had a sinus infection. So look, I see scarlet fever, vomiting, strep throat, pneumonia. I see infections. Okay, now, why do we care about infections? Because infections are inflammatory and infections like to be the trigger for autoimmunity. Now, we don't have time to dive into this deeply, but we do in, in the big, in the six module course that we're gonna do. One thing that happens is infections, whether they're viral or bacterial, when your body tries to clear that by making antibodies, the antibodies that it makes to target the virus and bacteria, those same antibodies can attach to healthy tissues. It's called cross reaction. So that's what I'm interested in as I'm seeing. Now, a lot of people have infections. It's not that you know, she should never have an infection, but just being who I am, I'm looking at that going, oh, that's interesting. Scarlet fever, strep throat, uh, a pneumonia, UTI, a sinus infection. 
Now, November 2018, yeah, go ahead. I could. Uh, back to the previous slide. You mentioned triggers for autoimmunity, and it's, it's, it's about triggers for autoimmunity. Um, yep. Have you noticed that? Have you ever heard of pregnancies being triggers for autoimmunity? Oh, sure. Yeah. So pregnancy is a great time to turn on autoimmunity. So, and that's because the kind of the cytokine systems of the body kind of swing one way or the other. So third trimester is a great time for autoimmunity to kick on. And postpartum is another time when autoimmunity can kick on. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Okay, cool. I, I, cause I've been kind of reading more about that. And uh, so when you started talking about triggers, I go, yeah, let me ask the expert while I got them. <laughs> sure. Well, there's lots of triggers. Absolutely. So in November 2018, she had the onset of some kind of heart rate irregularities. They gave her a Holter monitor that didn't notice anything. And speaking from someone who I had to wear a Holter monitor before in my life, I don't think they ever catch anything because uh, <laughs> I had definite events happening that, that just weren't caught. So who knows? Um, they, she said she could feel her heart beat very fast. She happened to look at her smartwatch, which showed her heart rate upward of 100 BPM and then as low as 50 BPM. Let me just tell you, if that watch is remotely accurate, that's dysautonomia. Now, she's getting an irregularity in heart rate. Now, if you remember the, the pathways that integrate onto the heart, you've got an SA node and an AV node. Uh, the SA node is, has more to do with uh, speed, and your AV node has more to do with rhythm. And she doesn't, it doesn't say she felt like a, a galloping or a thump thump. She felt just a tachycardia. So tachycardia, bradycardia makes us think, hmm, if there was a brain or, or nervous system component, it's probably going to be right brain, right cerebellum, or left brain, left cerebellum. We don't know yet, but we know if there is a neurological component, that it's got to be one of those two sides. Because remember, if one escapes, that's the same thing, like relatively speaking, right? So it's like if the, the side that should gate your tachycardia is not doing well, which is the right side, like it starts to, then you're going to have a heart rate that is faster. Okay. So that was probably more detail than I needed to go into. But anyway, that's what you got to be thinking about. You have to be thinking about when you read this. In March 2019, she had another UTI and took Bactrim and had an allergic reaction to that. Uh, about six months later, she had an episode of some kind of paresis or freezing where she couldn't move for about eight to 10 seconds. Now, I don't know what that is. Like, I don't really know, because sometimes people have, will have anxiety attacks and they'll feel like they're frozen and they can't move. I don't know. I mean, no one was really there to give me like a secondhand opinion on this. Um, could be it was just some kind of, you know, stress episode. I, hard to know. I mean, if she had like, you know, stiff person syndrome, you know, with GAD antibodies, that could do that, but she probably doesn't have that. Oh, but look at this though. She was diagnosed with Hashimoto's and tested positive for anti-nuclear antibodies. Uh, she was prescribed Synthroid and then NP thyroid, and, which are just hormone replacement medications. She said she felt really good on those for about two to three months, and then she became abruptly hyperthyroid. They rechecked her levels, and she was taken off the medication. Here's what happens in Hashimoto's, if you guys don't know. By the way, we have a big thyroid class I did on this. It's a three-day class. It's if you want to learn more about all this thyroid stuff. So... With Hashimoto's, it's an autoimmune condition, and ultimately what it causes is hypothyroidism. But during the process of having Hashimoto's, you can swing back and forth between hypo and temporarily hyper, because if the autoimmune condition is not really well controlled, what you'll get from time to time is basically like, I mean, it's kind of a stupid metaphor, but it's kind of like, uh, if you imagine the thyroid gland as being a bunch of grapefruits, right? And each grapefruit, there's got segments, right? Well, each one of those segments makes thyroid hormones. Well, what can happen in Hashimoto's if it's not well controlled is your, your immune system will infiltrate one of those grapefruits and blow it apart. And so you dump preformed hormones into the system rather than having them metered out the way that they normally would. And so the person can become hyperthyroid. Well, what happened with her is she had a need apparently for the thyroid medication and then she just didn't need it. And that happens a lot in younger kids, uh, younger people, is they can have a period where they're actually hypothyroid, but then they sort of kind of come out of it. Doesn't mean they're gone, doesn't mean they're, they're good forever, but that's probably why she just, she just didn't need the medication. So the medication plus what she was making on her own was just more than she needed. All right, but I'm interested in that. Because remember, one of my priorities is clinically significant autoimmunity. Well, I know that she's had some autoimmune stuff. 
I don't know if it's relevant yet, but I am very interested in it. Now, she did say going gluten-free helped, uh, which is, just so you guys know, gluten's like the worst thing you could eat if you have Hashimoto's or really any autoimmune condition. She says she's about 90% gluten-free now. She still occasionally gets treated monthly with some kind of IV vitamin treatment. I'm not a big fan of those uh, because with IV treatments, you're essentially short-circuiting all the normal GI mechanisms and intestinal absorption mechanisms. You're just freebasing it, basically. <laughs> you're just like mainlining it into your blood. And, you know, I just, I'd rather not do that if necessary, if not necessary. All right, now, what is she taking? Well, because you always ask people, what are they currently taking, right? Medication and otherwise. She takes some turmeric and vitamin D when she has flare-ups. Now, I don't know what she's describing as a flare-up, but I guess when she feels really bad, she'll take turmeric and vitamin D, which is good because both of those are actually quite good for, what, uh, for an inflammatory problem. Now, what's her family history? Well, why do we even care about family history? Well, because autoimmune conditions, number one, uh, really like to show up in families. They really like to show up in families. They're very, very heritable. Now, if we also found out that she had three or four people in her family who had, for example, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but she hadn't been diagnosed yet, okay, wait a second, you know? So you always do a family history, even when you're talking about metabolic things, because you're going to find stuff that you need to know about. So she had, a, she had a maternal grandmother with thyroid nodules. She had breast cancer and died from bone cancer. Don't like cancer history already. The paternal grandfather had brain cancer. She's got cancer on both sides of the family, if we think this is accurate. Her mom has Hashimoto's. That's not surprising at all. I mean, I'm just, you're not surprised at all to find out that your 21-year-old patient who got diagnosed with Hashimoto's has a mom with Hashimoto's. Like, you're just not surprised by that at all. Her father has some kind of migraine syndrome, and he has Graves' disease. So this poor child has got a parent, <laughs> each parent has got autoimmune thyroid disease. So there's almost a 100% chance that she was going to get one or both of those, right? We still don't know if it's relevant. So we shouldn't get too excited. We still don't know if it's relevant for her case, but we know that it's there. And she has a sister with hypothyroidism, which I'm going to tell you is going to turn out to be Hashimoto's if her sister ever gets tested. It's just, it's just not going to be anything but Hashimoto's. And another sister with thyroid nodules, who I guarantee has got Hashimoto's as well. Oh, and she's got a third sister that definitely has Hashimoto's. Like, you're going to see this if you start asking people about it. Hashimoto's runs in families big time. So system review. So we've done, you know, her chief complaint, kind of the history of things. We've looked at what she's taking. We looked at her family history. What is her system review? Like, what else constitutionally, if you will, is going on that can give us some clues about our four priorities? She notes cold extremities, dysautonomia. That's what that is. You should not have cold extremities. Reactivity to odors. Now, what she means by that is, is there are certain smells. If she smells them, she's going to get a headache. Okay. That is interesting for us from a metabolic standpoint, because people that have reactivity to odors frequently have a problem with a couple things. They usually have a problem with uh, one or more of their barrier systems. So you've got a gut barrier, a lung barrier, a blood sinus barrier, a blood labyrinth barrier, a blood brain barrier. People that react, like have rea like true reactions to smells or odors, have usually got some kind of breakdown in one of those barriers, if not, if not all of them. And it also implicates usually a problem with glutathione. Okay, So glutathione, just put that in your pocket. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. She also got some symptoms of decreased stomach acid. And what are those? I'll just tell you. Uh, and if I don't tell you in a second, I'll tell you now. Decreased stomach acid are, you get real bloated and, and burpy and belchy uh, within like 15 to 30 minutes after eating. So 15 to 30 minutes, the food has not had enough time to make it into your small intestine and give you intestinal gas. So people that have low stomach acid will often say that the food just like sits in their stomach and feels like a brick, right? She says she'll often go seven or eight hours or longer without eating at all. Well, I don't like that because that tells me she's probably got what we would call a lifestyle-induced hypoglycemia because she is not eating. And if you don't eat, if you don't take in calories, you're forcing your hypothalamus pituitary adrenal circuit to sense that and help you recover from that by secreting cortisol so that you can get storage glucose called glycogen, get that out of your muscles and liver. But if you don't make enough cortisol, 
then you're going to flood your body with catecholamines instead. Now, catecholamines can get some glycogen out of storage, but then you get this, right? And you get eyelid twitches. So someone who's going seven or eight hours without eating and has the symptoms she has, I'm already thinking, hmm, that, this is not like intermittent fasting. And this is someone who could never do that, by the way, kill them. So she's not consuming enough calories. When I look at her diet history, which I get on everybody, you can just see that she's not eating. She's eating like maybe 900 ca calories a day. And it's just not enough. It's just not enough calories. Now she does have a few symptoms associated with her menstrual period, including breast pain, swelling, and pelvic pain. Those are there. I mean, those aren't uncommon. Uh, the question is whether those really have anything to do with anything else. Now, let's examine her, right? We're going to examine her now. We're physically examining her. We're going to see what we find, right? You guys remember what we've got, right? We've got someone that had uh, word-finding difficulties, bumps into things with her right side, gets lightheaded when she stands up. She's got accentuated physiologic tremor, right? That, that's kind of the background. She veers to the right when she walks. Now, in Romberg's position, right, she has normal station with no excessive sway, even with challenge from right to left. So if you keep her still, feet together, eyes closed, she's not moving around, okay? And even if you smack her pretty good on the right and left shoulder like I do, she doesn't, she kind of, you know, she doesn't have any toxic response. She just kind of absorbs it. All right, cool. Put her hands in wing beating position. She's got that again, right? She's got that accentuated physiologic tremor. When you do bedside testing of saccade, just like with your thumbs here, she has slowness and increased latency of saccades from right to left, okay? that implicates more of a, a right brain sort of system. And maybe that kind of confuses you because you would think she would have slowness from left to right based on the stuff we already said about her left side of her brain. We don't know, right? She has what she has. Try not to force things to make sense if they don't, like, don't like come into it thinking, I'm going to find a bunch of left brain signs because you don't know if that's what you're going to find or not. So what that means is when you do this, you know, do, do, do old saccade tests, when she shoots from her right to her left, there is an increased latency, meaning it takes her longer to get going, and then it, they're slow, right? So neither one of those is very good uh, markers because you look at latency, accuracy, and velocity, and her accuracy was fine, but her latency and velocity were not. Gait analysis. So when she's just walking around looking at her gait, right, everything looks cool. Arms are kind of, arm swing is symmetrical. There's no posturing, right? But when you dual task her, and say, hey, I want you to subtract seven from 100 out loud and just keep doing that, both of her arms stop, right? So guys, I'm gonna stand up. I don't know if you can see me. Right? So like when we walk, you know, our arms should swing, right? When she starts doing this serial subtraction of seven, she goes 100, 100, 93, like her arms just stop moving. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that when we steal away some of her resources, uh, which I make her split her resources in her brain, it doesn't work. So both sides of her brain are probably compromised because typically it's a fairly reliable sign that whatever side of the, you know, like if the right arm stops swinging, it's the left brain you need to be looking at. Well, with her, both arms stop swinging. So perhaps it's not just a left brain problem with this patient. Perhaps it's both. It's a bilateral problem. Make sense? Yeah. No, if I could, I, you know, if if this type of work is new to you as you're watching this video, this is, I think, a really interesting test for people. What you got to remember is that walking is a fairly automatic process, right? Like, it, it's not like you're asking the person, uh, you know, spin this plate and, and rub your belly in a circle at the same time type of thing. It's like, this is like something you do all the time. And if right. that degrades, well, you just have, or you start utilizing some substrate in your brain, you kind of go, hold on one second. I, I don't like that. You yeah. know, I don't like that. You typically want to see that your patients be able to achieve that with some level of success for sure. Yeah, exactly. And with this patient, both aren't, sometimes what they'll do is they'll start to become robotic, right? Sometimes they'll even freeze. Like yeah, sometimes they'll, stop, they'll, just, yeah. they'll just stop. Those are all bad. And of course, we have courses that tell you how to understand that. Yeah. They freeze like, and just fall over. Just oh, yeah. <laughs> or or, with, or, they'll, or they'll start to veer. Like they'll just start to veer off center. With her, she can do the subtraction, which is good, but the automatic movement stops, which tells you it's on both sides of the brain. Now, we get to look at her heart rate, because remember, this lady gets lightheaded and gets black vision when she stands up. So we've got to assess that. It would be silly not to do that. So if you ever lay down on her back for a little bit, her heart rate was 58 after resting quietly for three minutes. I got to tell you, that's pretty bradycardic to me. Like, that's pretty low for someone who's not doing exercise, 
who's not really conditioned, she's not a runner, right? Then we go from supine all the way to standing in one movement. Her heart rate went from 58 to 95, okay? That's 37 BPM, that's excessive. Like, because for what that tells you is, is that that 58 is not, that's not good. Because 58 to like, you know, 78 or 80, eh, that's all right. She probably just, maybe she's just conditioned, but 58 to 95 is not good. So we know that there's an inappropriateness with that. Cerebellar testing, upper lower extremity was normal. Doing her pursuits, tested at bedside, um, were pretty good with her head still. With her eye head pursuit, she had a little resistance to neck stretch. So the pursuits really weren't an issue. What's our impression just based off of that? Well, here's what we got. What could be going on with her? Frontal lobe malfunction? Sure. Dysautonomia? Sure. I mean, we know that's happening. Why could it be dysautonomic? Well, because she's not getting blood to her head and, and her, her orthostatic responses are abnormal. Now, we can't tell just by going from supine to stand what's happening. We know that that's a tachycardic response, but it's a little more complicated than that. Could there be a metabolic issue? Sure, like if she's hypoglycemic or anemia, that'll make you hypotensive for sure. And we know that she's got some kind of problem with either not eating, right, or she's not being able to make cortisol. There's something going on with that HPA axis, and it could just be as simple as, as you're not eating. <laughs> you know, eat every couple hours. That may solve all of that. We don't know yet. So where do we start? Well, there's so many different places you could start. I mean, metabolic and neurochemical is what we're talking about right now, but you notice I'm mixing in there all this kind of neuroanatomical and pathway stuff because that's what you got to do if you're going to serve at a, at, a, at, a, at a high level for these people. Uh, Receptor-based rehab, like, so look, you could just go ahead and say, look, she's got dysautonomic, looks like bilateral frontal lobe, I'm just going to figure out, I'm going to finish, I'm going to do some more exam, I'm just going to treat her brain. That's cool, but in this case, if you're going to do that, you better focus on the autonomics, right? Because she's got a clear dysautonomia. Could you just adjust her? You could. I mean, there is no real indication to adjust her other than that little head still pursuit thing. She had a little resistance to stretch her neck. You could do a snag, right? You could do that. It might work. I mean, it might work. Or you could do something else. You could do acupuncture. You could do, I don't know, whatever the hell else you want to do. But the thing is, wherever you start on that little pathway there, you better have a standard in place where you know, is this patient getting better? Is this working for them? And if it's not working, what am I going to do next? I'm going to start with the metabolic neurochemical, and here's why. Because she has a strong history of Hashimoto's. She's been diagnosed with Hashimoto's. I, and she's got that accentuated physiologic tremor. Those, to me, are screaming that those are metabolic problems. So I, I, do want, to, I want to investigate this first and see what I get. So again, here's the neurochemical priorities. Number four, GI and liver malfunction. Well, you know, does she have this? I mean, she's got a little GI symptom. She's got the little stomach acid stuff, but nothing really major. Now, liver, there's no really liver symptoms per se. You just have to use, look at transaminases on blood work and see what it looks like. So we don't know about that. What about cellular energy with HP axis and glucose handling? Yeah, I mean, she actually does have that. I don't know why I put a question mark because she definitely has got that just based on Let's put it this way. We don't know if it's lifestyle induced or if there's some other reason, but she's got a problem with that. I should put a little check mark there. What about cellular energy part two, looking at red blood cells and nutrients and mitochondria? We don't know that based off of her history. We have to do some blood work to figure that part out. And what about the autoimmunity? Yes, we know that she's got some autoimmunity. We just don't know if it's clinically significant. So I've said that a bunch of times. And I want you guys to hear me. Just because she's got Hashimoto's doesn't mean the Hashimoto's is causing all of this. It doesn't mean that. So what tests are appropriate? Because look, we talked about the tests you, you, you could do here neurologically, right? I did saccades, pursuits, Rombergs, gait analysis, did all that. What about metabolically? Well, doing, choosing the test and, and the appropriate test, and I beat this to death, but I'm going to tell it to you every time we do one of these case reviews. Appropriate testing depends on, number one, the clinical yield. What are you going to get out of doing that test? Is it going to change your mind? Is it going to change your treatment? If it's not, then don't do it. Number two, logistics, and what I mean by that is, are you gonna have to wait two or three weeks or four weeks to get the test results back? Could you instead just treat the person and use the treatment as the test, right? Could you do that instead? And then number three, the patient's budget. Because look, you don't wanna blow all the, I mean, you wanna be ethical about it. You don't wanna just blow some $5,000 on testing. I would much rather them have that money available for treatment, 
right? So I think if we get very good at using history and symptoms and really started to kind of understand the physiology and we get a lot of experience, you're not gonna have to do stool testing, adrenal salivary testing, hormone testing all month long. You're not gonna have to do all that stuff because that's just simply casting as huge a net as you possibly could to hope you find something wrong that you can treat. And you're doing that, if you are, you're doing that because you don't really know, you don't really have it narrowed down. You know what I mean? Like you're just hoping something shows up that you can treat and maybe that'll work, right? We're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do that. So there's all these things. This is basically what we already just kind of went through. What would we do? Well, I'm definitely gonna do blood chemistry, absolutely. Because I need to look at our red blood cells. I need to look at uh, liver enzymes and all the stuff that's on these panels and her LDH, which I'll explain in a minute her lipid panel, the thyroid panel with antibodies, because look, she was diagnosed Hashimoto's in the past. She doesn't th take thyroid medication now. Maybe she should. Maybe she's back to a place where she should be taking it. I got to look at her D and B12 and folate and her ferritin and her homocysteine. I'm going to look at all that stuff because I could make a case right now, just based on the physiology for each one of those things. Like if there was something wrong, like if her homocysteine was high, I could explain to you how that could be connected to her chief complaints. Doesn't mean it is, but how it could be, right? Am I gonna do adrenal testing? Because everybody loves to do adrenal testing, right? No, I am not gonna do that, why? Because it's just gonna show, if anything, that she's got low adrenal function, right? That, that's all it's gonna show because she doesn't eat for seven or eight hours. She's flooded with catecholamines. Those adrenal tests don't measure catecholamines anyway. They just look at cortisol or cortisol metabolites and DHEA. That's not going to tell me anything. Her symptoms, I'm telling you guys, your, her symptoms are, are better than most of the adrenal testing you could do. They just, they're just more reliable, okay? Stool testing, no, there's no indication she needs anything with that. I mean, I, just, I don't hardly ever do stool testing unless someone has overt GI symptoms that like no one's been, like, and they haven't done the stool testing already because usually people that make it to me, I'm usually the third, fourth, or fifth person they've seen. They've already had the stool testing done. They've already had the heavy metal testing done. And, you know, they're still not better, but I'm not probably not, gonna, I'm not doing stool testing on her. But I am possibly going to do this thing called an immune system challenge because how do I find out if this autoimmune situation that we know she has, how do we find out if that's clinically relevant, clinically significant? How could we do that? Well, we could do this thing called an immune system challenge. And I'll tell you about that in just a second. So here's her lab results. So uh, RDW, which is your red cell distribution with 12.2, that's lab low. That doesn't mean as much as if that was high, okay? Red cell distribution width is an average, it's, it tells you the average difference but in the sizes of the red blood cells in the sample. So there should be some variation. If there's a huge variation, it tells you that there's some red blood cells that are this big and there's some that are this big. Red cell distribution width that's high is usually there if there's an anemia, okay? It being low is a way less clinically relevant. And by the way, all these lab tests I'm talking about that I do, that's what I teach in the neurochemistry classes. I would go through every one of these and explain what is it testing, what's normal, what's not normal, what does it mean, you know, by itself, what does it mean if you've got a pattern of results? That's what we're looking for. All right, so neutrophils are a type of white blood cell and her neutrophil percent was 70. That's a little high for my standard. That means there could be some immune system activation of some kind. Her lymphocyte percentage is 21. You'll often see that when someone's neutrophils percentage are like 70, very often you'll see the lymphocytes kind of go down correspondingly the same amount. And that means there's usually something making the immune system turn on. Now her B12 is 1,542, and that's high by the reference range. She denies taking any kind of B12 containing supplements or having a B12 IV since October, which is about three months before. This piques my interest because there's only three things that can make you have high B12, basically, okay? Number one, if you're taking it, right? That makes B12 high, but it's not dangerous. High B12 is not dangerous. It's water soluble. You don't store it in your fat. I mean, it's not a big deal. The second thing to make your B12 high is if you had advanced liver disease, because B12 is stored in the liver, and if your liver is breaking up and falling apart and you're dumping B12 into the system, that would be bad, but she doesn't have that. The third thing that can do it, which is what I'm most interested in, is you can have something called intrinsic factor antibodies. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, intrinsic factor 
is a substance made by the stomach, and you have to have it in order to absorb B12 through your GI tract. And the reason it's connected with this little B12 finding is because you can make, your immune system can make antibodies to intrinsic factor. It can target it. And the machine that the labs use that measure B12, it can't tell the difference between B12 and intrinsic factor antibodies. It can't tell the difference. So what you can see is sometimes someone has high B12 and their liver is not falling apart and they don't take B12. Why is their B12 high? It could be because they have intrinsic factor antibodies, which is an autoimmune condition. So then we want to look at her B12 levels and look at her red blood cells. Now her folate is okay. I mean, I'd like it to be a little bit higher than that. Her vitamin D is not okay. That's, that's way too low. Okay. And you see that time and time and time again in people that have autoimmune conditions. It's just part of the genetic package that goes along. You take 100 people with autoimmune conditions that aren't taking vitamin D, 90 of them are going to have low vitamin D. I feel really confident telling you that. Why do we care? Well, because vitamin D is anti-inflammatory. Uh, vitamin D has an impact on your serotonin and dopamine chemistry. Vitamin D is very, very important. Now, her thyroid quantities, looking at TSH and T4, those are fine. Nothing going on there. Now, her thyroglobulin antibodies, which is one of the markers for Hashimoto's, that is high. Now, when you have antibodies that are high, but all the thyroid quantity markers are normal, we call that euthyroid Hashimoto's. Doesn't mean, it's not, it doesn't mean it's not relevant. It just means it's not causing a quantity disturbance, and she doesn't need to be taking replacement hormone medication. It could still be causing a problem, because she's got antibodies, which means we've got a cytokine load. We still have autoimmunity. We just still, still don't know if it's clinic, clinically relevant. Okay? Yeah. For the patients that are using thyroid Hashimoto's, do you find that, you know, you look at their lab levels for thyroid hormone specifically, whether they should be on thyroid hormone or not, and you go, oh, you know, they're youth thyroid, they're still good, still good. But if you wait long enough and, and the autoimmunity is unchecked, will they eventually have dysregulation of the thyroid hormone? The, the specific yeah. thyroid hormones? Yeah, the hormones. vast majority will. Like the vast majority of people that have, at any point, Hashimoto's antibodies, uh, at some point, and like if you didn't do anything with them, they're probably going to end up hypothyroid. I and mean, there's basically three phases you go through. The first phase, we call that, well, not even the first phase, it's just a different scale. You've got euthyroid Hashimoto's, which is where you've got the antibodies, but the, the thyroid quantities are not, are not uh, abnormal. Fine. That can still make you feel like crap because of the cytokines involved. The second kind of phase is what we call subclinical. And that's when you've got the antibodies that are high and your TSH is high. Now you may or may not at that point get prescribed medication by someone. It just depends on how bad your TSH is. The last stage is overt hypothyroidism where you've got the antibodies are high, your TSH is high, and either your free T4 or T4 or T3 is low, right? So what usually happens, here's, here's, what, here's what I can tell you. Someone who's subclinical, meaning they've got the antibodies and their TSH is a little elevated, they very, very often end up converting into actual full-blown overt hypothyroid Hashimoto's. People that have the antibodies high and their quantities are abnormal, especially if they're young, eh, they may or may not. They may or may not convert. But like if you're 35 or 40 and you've got antibodies and your TSH is not elevated yet and you don't do anything about it, there's a good chance it's going to happen. It's a good, it's a good chance it's going to progress. Now, our TPO antibodies are 27, and that's not nothing because the lab range says the reference range is zero to 34. So she's definitely at the upper end of that limit, and we know she's had this anyway. We know she's had these anyway. But now, how do we find out if it's relevant? I mean, how, we know all that, but how do we know if it's really a, has anything to do with this? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go back and I'm going to analyze this again, and I just want to show you based on our four priorities, okay? So the four priorities are, okay, so the GI and liver function, I uh, didn't see any of that. The HPA axis, didn't really see any of that. But with our cellular energy, right, her folate's 12.8. I mean, that's okay. It's not terrible, but, you know, her ferritin was okay. Uh, her B12 is high, uh, but that we're not sure about that. So, you know, really don't have much for number four. Don't really have anything on the blood work to tell us about number three. But remember, she's not eating, and that may be our number three for her. She's just not eating. And then clinically significant autoimmunity, well, I mean, maybe, but let's figure it out. Let's figure it out. 
So again, if you're trying to figure out if someone has an autoimmune problem, just do they have one at all, you can do specific antibody testing, um, or you can just try to answer the question kind of generally, does this, person, does this person have any autoimmune problem? Well, with antibody testing, you know, it's specific, but it's gonna be expensive. I mean, whether your insurance covers it or not, I mean, you can spend as much money as you want on antibody testing. Like, I mean, you can spend really as much money as you wanna spend, and it doesn't mean you're gonna find anything. So, but the thing with antibody testing is it's not encyclopedic, meaning like this. What I mean is, like I use uh, Cyrex Labs Array 5, all, well, not all the time, but I use it. Now, I don't have any, I have no disclosures with them. I they don't make any money off, uh, off of them or anything. But, you know, they have 24 antibodies that you can do from one blood sample. And it's, it's a good test. I mean, it's a nice survey of, of several different body systems, but it's not everything. So it's a mistake to run that test, and if none of that stuff on that test comes back abnormal, it's a mistake to say, well, nothing is abnormal. You don't have any autoimmune problem. Total mistake. The same way it's a mistake to say, well, you had a celiac test and it was negative, so you don't have a problem with gluten. Also incorrect, all right? So that's the thing about antibody testing. Now with the clinical challenge, it's very cheap. I mean, it's like 20, 25 bucks, but it's not specific, meaning it doesn't tell you the name of the condition. It can't tell you which antibodies are involved. But it's okay because really what we're trying to do with this autoimmune thing is say, hey, is it clinically significant? Because if it is, it doesn't really matter a lot about what the name of it is because we can treat it very, very similarly. So there's hundreds of different autoimmune conditions. And they all get different names based on what's being attacked. But biochemically, all the pathways involved are very, very similar. And we can basically treat them all with the same set of tools, right? So what we have them do is we're going to have this patient ingest. And by the way, don't go do this. You don't know how, you don't know, I'm not telling you how to do this. I'm telling you how I did it. I'm just showing you this. I have her ingest some T helper one cytokine stimulators for a couple of days. And then we're going to ingest some T helper two cytokine stimulators. And we're going to see how she feels. Now, I'm going to say this to you, and I've said it before, because somebody's going to do it. You would never do this on someone that you think might have a demyelinating condition. You would never do it on anyone that you know had a demyelinating condition. You would never do it with someone that hasn't agreed to do it, right? Like you have to tell them, hey, here's what we're looking for. You could feel worse. You could feel nothing. You could feel better. We don't know. You have to get their informed consent to do this, right? Um, and you would never do it on someone that you don't think couldn't handle feeling worse for a little while, right? So don't go around and do it because you don't know what you're doing yet. But just listen, listen how we use it here. So here's the results of this patient's clinical challenge. She had no response to the T helper one or T helper two cytokine stimulators. And her white blood cell count was normal. Well, what does that mean? Because what you're really looking for when you, do this, when you do this challenge is you're looking to see if one or both of those things makes her feel bad. So what if they feel nothing? Well, we're probably not dealing with significant autoimmunity. I mean, I say probably because you're never going to be 100% sure, but we're probably not dealing with an autoimmune issue as the root or a major factor with what's going on with her, despite the fact that she has euthyroid Hashimoto's and that strong family history. Now, that being said, we still know that she has a need for vitamin D. We still know she, that she has a, a, I mean, I say need, I mean, I'd like her folate to be better. We know that there's some immune system activation going on just based on the CVC. We know she has euthyroid Hashimoto, so we know there's some cytokine activity going on. There's a cytokine, uh, very likely a, a high cytokine load, possible intrinsic factor antibody. She's not eating enough calories. So what do we do? Okay, what do we do? Well, there's always a diet component for almost everybody. Not, not everybody gets the same diet, but guess what we're going to tell her to do? If I just said, hey, you're not eating enough calories, what do you think I'm going to tell her? eat. You got to eat, but it needs to be gluten-free, dairy-free. If for no other reason, then I don't want your Hashimoto's to get worse. Okay. Now I don't have time to explain all the reasons why, but just, I guess, trust me at the moment or take the class. Uh, gluten and dairy are the two worst things she could eat. So I'm like, you've got to eat. Now she works as a hairdresser. I forgot to tell you guys, he works as a hairstylist. And so she's got six or seven, eight hour shifts when she's staring, staring on her feet. I'm like, well, you're going to have to eat. I don't care how you do it. You can't just go seven hours without eating anything and just drinking Red Bull and caffeine. You can't do it. Now, what are we going to do with her supplement wise? Well, I just told you right here, right? I mean, we're going to give her some sublingual vitamin D, not capsule vitamin D, not tablet vitamin D, but sublingual vitamin D. 
I'm going to use some sublingual liquid folinic acid. I'm going to use some turmeric. I don't know why it's underlined. I'm going to use some turmeric and resveratrol. Now, why am I doing that? Well, even though I said that it's probably not significant autoimmunity, she does still have some immune system activation. She still has these antibodies. She's got an autoimmune problem. So I'm going to go ahead and hedge my bets. I'm just going to do something for, for 30 days. I'm just going to see if it makes a difference because it's not going to hurt her for me to do this. Because turmeric and resveratrol are excellent anti-inflammatories and they're probably, they're probably the most powerful anti-inflammatories we could use that really aren't drugs. Uh, and they're very, very good at down-regulating these autoimmune pathways. So I'm also going to use some sublingual glutathione. If you guys remember, I told you that someone that has a reactivity to odors usually implicates a problem with glutathione. Well, glutathione is also very important for regulating your immune system response. It kind of fine tunes uh, that innate immune system response. And then I'm using something called butyrate. Why? Because butyrate is a short chain fatty acid. And it's very, very important for the health and the structural integrity of those barrier systems, primarily butyrate in the GI tract. Butyrate's kind of cool. Butyrate also does good stuff for your blood brain barrier too. So from one little dude there, I can get some GI barrier attention and some blood brain barrier. Now, granted, this is sort of me going, well, you know what? She's not eating enough, but I know she needs vitamin D and she's got some autoimmune stuff. I'm just going to do this and see, right? I'm not going to do it forever, right? I have a standard in place. I'm going to do it for 30 days, right? Now, I'm also going to give her some omega-3 fatty acids because they're anti-inflammatory in a different mechanism. So that's my, that's my bar, guys. That's my standard is 30 days. So if I do this for 30 days and it makes a significant difference, well, okay. Now, all right, now we know this, okay. That doesn't mean we're done. And that's the thing. Most educational programs that do this kind of stuff, and this is kind of my, my bone to pick with them, is they never really tell you what to do after the initial, here's what you give them, right? It's like, oh, they have a headache, give them this, give them riboflavin. And it's never, what if that doesn't work? <laughs> you know, and what if the second thing doesn't work? And what if the third thing doesn't work, right? They never tell you that. Never tell you when to follow up. When do I retest? You know, what am I looking for? So we're going to do all the stuff that you should know how to do. We're going to do it right now. So 30 days. We're looking for changes again. We're looking for changes in our word finding, the haze feeling, the walking into things. We're looking for all of that stuff to change. Now, she says in terms of the word finding, there's been a decrease in the frequency of that, at least something she can tell. Now, she says it's happening five to six, instead of happening five to six days a week, it's three to four days. That's marginal, to be honest with you. I mean, I mean, I know that she's noticing a difference and that's cool, but I'm not, I'm not impressed by that. No change in the hazy Benadryl feeling. The feeling dizzy is slightly better. No change in walking into things. So look, we're not batting a thousand here. Like we're not, we're not doing very well with our metabolic approach for her. Whether it's not hurting her, but it's not really getting to the root of the, the stuff that was her problem. Now, when I re-examined her after 30 days, no change in that, that wing beating uh, physiologic tremor. So we're not really addressing that. Saccades at bedside, you know, it's going to be a little bit faster. You know, that's just me qualitatively. I don't have it on her saccadometer. That's just me. She's coming in for 15 minutes. I'm looking at stuff and going, yeah, it's a little bit better. You know, it's not perfect, but it's certainly not like it was. It's a little bit better. Uh, but look, I dual task her and we still get the decreased arm swing bilaterally when she starts to subtract. So we haven't really done much for that either. Okay. So I could look at this and go, well, what I'm doing is not what it is, right? I could look at it and go, well, what if I did it for 30 more days? I mean, you could do that. I mean, I don't have a problem. If you, if you were me at this time and you said, well, let's just try it for 30 more days and she was cool with it, I really don't have a problem with that. But if you do this for, if you do that treatment plan for 60 days and it still looks like this after the end of 60 days, don't, don't keep doing it. It's not going to just magically get better after 90 days. I mean, this type of stuff that you do metabolically with people, this neurochemical stuff, it doesn't take six months to see it get better. Like 30 days really is most of the time, plenty of time to see if you're on the right path. She really looks dysautonomic on this day that I re-examined her. I mean, her heart rate, when I put her down, never got below 82. Now, remember, it was 58 the first time. Now, it never got below 82, right? And it was in the 90s, often just laying there supine quietly. So she has got instability of that heart rate. Now, I tried to get her to do some diaphragmatic breathing because what, what do we do when we do this on people and we're trying to use brain-based and receptor-based rehab, right? We're trying to do diagnostic stimulations, right? We're trying to see, can I reach in and, 
and change the system somehow to see if I can get, even if it's just a momentary change. Well, so I try to do diaphragmatic breathing because diaphragmatic breathing, if it's going to work, uh, would help bring her heart rate down. Well, it didn't. It actually made her worse. <laughs> so, and she is kind of paradoxically breathing. And what that means is her chest is moving more than her diaphragm. Okay. So hold on to that. And then when we went from seated to stand this time, her heart rate went as high as 125. Okay. And she definitely got lightheaded that time. So the dysautonomia is not better. I mean, really nothing's better. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? Like none of it's better, but that's okay. I'm not scared of that. The reason I'm not scared of that is I know what I'm going to do next, right? If you don't know what to do next, you get a little scared and you hope maybe the patient doesn't call, or doesn't come back or doesn't email you, right? But if you do it the way you're supposed to, you're not scared. You know what's next. So what do we do now? What do we do? We give up? Tell her to take double? You just take double of everything. That's my favorite sort of thing that people that don't really know what they're doing tell patients. Just take it double. Come on. Well, I'm going to do something called a Cambridge Brain Sciences evaluation because I'm curious how much of this is really affecting her cognitive function. I'm just, I just want to see, right? And I'm going to recheck her vitamin D, CBC, B12, and folate. Why am I doing that? Well, because what if she's not absorbing the things I'm giving her? Well, that could be why she's not doing better, right? That's a possibility. So before I rush off and just throw the baby out with the bathwater and burn the bridge, let's find out if she's actually even absorbing the stuff I'm giving her. Because look, if I do the recheck and it's clear that she's absorbing everything, but she's still not better, well, it's just those things are good for her. It just doesn't have nothing to do with the chief complaint, right? If I redo those tests and nothing's absorbing, then we have a different problem, right? We have a different problem. Now, depending on what those labs show or don't show, we're going to start doing some brain-based rehab, focusing on that dysautonomia, which I think is the core problem, right? Because remember, neurologically, neurologically speaking, autonomics are your number one priority because if you don't get blood to the brain area, it's not going to work. Same treatment plan for now. Just going to keep, every, you keep, keep eating the way, same way. Keep taking these few things. It's not going to stay that way forever, I can tell you that. Like this is not something she's just going to do forever now, but there's no need, no need to change it. All right, so here's your Cambridge Brain Sciences results. Just take like five seconds and look at that. There's nothing abnormal, right? None of that is abnormal. Now, to be truthful, she did that when she was sitting down. And what would have been more appropriate is have her do that when she was standing up, right? Because there's going to be more stress on the system, more chance that the dysautonomia is going to bring out malfunction. So that was kind of a missed opportunity on my, my part. Okay, so here's the recheck. All right, so you guys are with me, right? So we worked this patient up. We said, hey, here's what we think's going on. Here's what tests are gonna make sense for us to try to find on our four priorities what we think could be happening. We did some blood work, we did the challenge, we've done some treatment, didn't really do anything. Let's find out if she absorbed it and it didn't do anything or she didn't absorb it and that's why it didn't do anything. So our neutrophil percent is 60, used to be 70. That's more normal, that's more normal. Lymphocyte percentage went up about 7%. That's pretty cool. That, I mean, that, that's somewhat. So maybe we de-inflamed her a little bit. Her B12 is still high. And I'm telling you guys, I bet she's got intrinsic factor antibodies. I feel pretty confident telling you that. Now, just so you know, long-term, because every patient has a long-term relationship with me, we're going to keep an eye on that. Because if she starts to show on her red blood cells that her red blood cells are starting to get big, okay, that means she's not absorbing B12 in the long term. This confuses the heck out of people because you're saying, but her B12 is high. No, I'm not. I'm saying her B12 probably is not high. It's spuriously high. It looks high because the machine can't tell the difference between real B12 and intrinsic factor antibodies. Intrinsic factor antibodies over time are going to cause you to not have B12. You're not going to be able to absorb it. So with this patient, we need to track her long term at least every once in a while and just check her CBC um, at least check the CBC and see what she looks like. Her folate, we know she's absorbing that, right? Because went, that went up uh, over eight points. Her vitamin D, a eh, little on the high side. <laughs> so she definitely absorbed the vitamin D, right? No question about that. 111 is not really dangerous. I mean, look, if you, if you measured her serum calcium and it's not high, then she's probably fine. She could keep it that high if she wanted to. I mean, it's more... Everybody's more comfortable if their vitamin D is lower than that. 
but it's not dangerous. Okay, well look, she absorbed the stuff we gave her, but it didn't help with any of those chief complaints. So what do we do now? Well, we're gonna do rehab because that's probably what's gonna do it for us. I think she does need to take vitamin D long-term because we know she has autoimmunity, right? We know that. And one of the ways to prevent future problems five, 10, 15 years from now is to make sure she's not vitamin D deficient for the next decade. Uh, I'm gonna have her take folate long-term. And here's why, because in my experience, people that show up with a folate level like 12 or less, if they don't take supplemental folate in some form, their folate over time goes down. Now there's reasons why that could, it's probably related to her. It's probably related to a malabsorption syndrome that's part and parcel with, I think she probably has a gluten sensitivity. So just kind of bear with me. That's why I'm gonna have her take it long term. But now, now let's talk about the rehab we did. Now, not often do I get to go through the rehab. I mean, I think the last case we did, I did some of that. So here's what we did. I had her come back in. I can say, hey, well, let's just, let's look at this dysautonomia thing from the ground up again, right? So I use this thing called a Biocom uh, heart rate variability analyzer. I don't have any uh, financial interest in them and I don't make any money off of them. What did it show us? There's basically three tests that you can do. There's an autonomic balance test stress response. And basically when she's just sitting there silently, her parasympathetics are low. Okay. So that means parasympathetics being low, she's going to have more probably tone in her sympathetics. Okay at least while she was doing this test. The cardiovascular tolerance test is where they stand up. Well, actually what they do is they're, they're seated for five minutes and then it's recording and then they stand up and it's recording and then it records them for another five minutes. And what it showed with her is she had total cardiac adaptive dysfunction. Okay, yeah, we know that, right? Now this is what I think is really interesting is the third test you can do, like it's kind of, th these tests are like uh, this little kind of packaged little analyses. Now you can also do live HRV analysis, like you can hook her up to the machine and put her through different uh, positions and stand-ups and all kinds of stuff and like look and see what happens live. But just to kind of keep things short, just to kind of give you guys uh, something to hold on to, these are the tests that, that kind of come out of the box. Not outside the box, but come out of the machine. So the baroreceptor test is where they're gonna breathe in and breathe out rhythmically based on a little cue, a visual cue on the screen, right? And so what it's going to tell you is how are those baroreceptors, you know, in the aortic arch and in the carotid bodies, are they responding? Is that whole baroreceptor circuit responding appropriately? And the answer for her is no. She has low function of the baroreceptors. Now, I think this is really interesting. Here's what I've seen with a lot of patients. People that have a lot of variability in the tachycardia, they have this very often. And what it means is, is every time she takes a breath, she's having a dysautonomic response. Because when you breathe in, that's a sympathetic activity. And when you breathe out, it's parasympathetic. But every time she's breathing in and out, she's having abnormal responses. The question is why? Is it the baroreceptors themselves? Now here's what we gotta do, right? So now we've just said, look, there's a problem in this circuit. What are all the players in this circuit? And how do we figure out if it's one of those players, right? Is it the baroreceptors? Well, she doesn't, she's not 60. She doesn't have atherosclerotic disease. The chances of her baroreceptors being broken themselves is not good. So it's probably a central integrator problem in that brainstem. It's probably something in the brainstem, right? Uh, let's find out if it's that way. But let me tell you what this means though. The fact that that baroreceptor test is abnormal, we know that when she breathes, that's why when I had her do that breathing, like remember a couple of slides ago, that's why it made her worse. You can't do breathing exercises with her, not breathing exercises alone, because they're not gonna work, right? You're gonna have to do something to modify that brain stem response for any of that to work. You can't use breathing exercises with this lady by themselves. All right, so her blood, blood pressure while seated was 106 over 76. Yeah, that's not too bad. But again, she has paradoxical breathing. Her chest moves more than her diaphragm, so you, so you know she's not ventilating her lungs appropriately. You know that. Now, what I tried to do treatment-wise, I said, we're going to do some breathing, but we're going to maybe do some other things with it. So I had her lay down, and we did breathing with a 4-1-7 pattern. You inhale for four seconds, you hold for a second, you exhale for seven. Doing that today, this day that we did this rehab, I was able to get her heart rate down to around 65. 
okay? Which is about 30 points lower than it was during the HRV testing where she was definitely tachycardic, right? Now that was her laying at zero degrees of elevation, so she's flat. We're doing some good supine belly breathing, and today it's working. Remember a couple slides ago when I did it, it didn't work, but right now it is working. All right, cool, what does that mean? Well, we started to layer in some brain stem integration responses to see if we could get her from here ultimately up to here, right? Well, we, this is how we did it. I say we and I say me. So did the supine belly breathing, but with that began doing some different types of pons stimulation. So pons, you know, the brain stem, cerebellum sits on top of it. So here's what we found. In a nutshell, I did this belly breathing exercise with her, pons stimulations, and here what we did, we did a corneal blink, which everybody loves. Trust me, your patients love corneal blink stimulation, right? Get jabbed in the cornea by a Kleenex. You, you really can only do that about one time before they, you know, they start to guard terribly involuntarily. So you've really got to like be sneaky. But what's interesting with this, now this is what worked with this patient. This may not work with the next patient that comes in that has the exact same presentation. These may not work. So there is no protocol you're memorizing, even for rehab. There's no protocol you're memorizing from the stuff I did metabolically. You're not going to robot that. And you can't robot this stuff either. You're just going to have to do it and see if it's there. So the corneal blink was effective in getting her heart rate down. Face massage worked. And I got to tell you, I've had two or three patients for whom that kind of zygomatic arch facial massage worked freaking great. Other people didn't do anything. But for the people that it worked for, it, it works really well. And also doing with this some horizontal saccades. Why? Because those abducens nuclei are in the pons, right? So these are all things we can do to try to integrate raising her up so we get that kind of orthostatic demand, but then try to make it be appropriate by using these different types of pons and brainstem centers to see if we can have a, a measured, coordinated response to changes in the elevation of her head, okay? So that might mean we go from zero to 15, and we see what happens. And then we go from 15 to 20. And this is like, this can take a while. <laughs> I mean, like, you, this can take a while. But you do it, uh, and, and it works. And pursuits for the same reason, because those uh, abducens are in there. And so we combined those stimulations with those gradual elevations or tilts from supine eventually to seated, and then from seated to standing. Like that's how you have to do them. You want to get her from, so like she may be totally fine from zero to 30, meaning you take her from zero to 30, heart rate doesn't move at all, and it shouldn't. Like if you're just going from zero degrees to 30 degrees elevation, your heart rate really shouldn't do much unless there's a problem. Well, if it's good from zero to 30, then we just start at 30 and work our way up, right? So anyway, I don't want to beat that up too much because that's a lot to try to throw in there, but this is what we do. And I also put in there some proprioceptive challenges just to try to make things novel, uh, just to make it not so boring. Because look, if the patient sits on the table, you know, 30 minutes, three times a day for four days, I'm trying to keep her limbic system involved, trying to keep her in good spirits. So doing some proprioceptive challenges that, that may not really be all that therapeutic. <laughs> they were just something to try to keep her, you know, keep her uh, uh, interest up. All right. So what happened? At the end of four days of doing that, what we just talked about, uh, going from supine to stand in one fell swoop, only a 12 BPM elevation. That's good. We like that. That's very good. No lightheadedness, no changes in the vision, and that brain fog feeling she had, that Benadryl feeling, that's all gone. That's all gone after four days. Why? because her problem was she was not getting blood to her head. That was the problem, okay? And it was a problem because she had a baroreceptor uh, problem and she had a brainstem integration issue. I mean, that's what the problem was. Now, but we're not that excited yet. We were cool, we're like, hey, thumbs up, awesome, right? I'm gonna post on Facebook about how awesome I am. You know, look at this person I, I healed, no. We're not doing that because we got to wait two weeks to find out how much good did we really do. And as I explained in the last video, immediate early responses don't, aren't really immediate and they aren't really early. That's a kind of a misnomer. It usually takes one or two days to start seeing those changes. Now you can see change, but changes like genetic plastic changes take a couple of days to start setting in. 
The medium term changes take about five days. Hence why we treat people typically, I treat people four or five days. And then the long term changes take up to about two weeks to kind of plasticize and develop. So that's when you really start to find out, okay, well, how much did that really stick? Because look, guys, and women, I mean guys non-specifically, if you treat someone, right, and you get super excited and you're awesome after four days or five days, but two weeks later, they feel like crap again. You didn't do it, you didn't do your job. You're not done, right? You're not done. You have to follow up with them and see, okay, how are they doing, right? So she's 100% asymptomatic two weeks later. You know, we like that, okay? We like that. Four weeks later, she's back at work standing eight hours as a hairstylist. She's eating, she's continuing to eat, right? That's a big deal, giving her uh, that, that fuel. Still 100% symptom free. So look, after four days she was good, two weeks after that she was good, four weeks after that she's good, the chances are she's gonna stay good. I mean, honestly, right? The chances are she's gonna, now, she's got an autoimmune problem. It's possible that that flares up in the future and screws up everything, we don't know. Excuse me, but that's what, that's what we're looking for. So four weeks after that, She's had no symptoms in three months. That's pretty good, man. I have to, now, I, that's, that I can accept. <laughs> that I can get excited about. So what are the takeaways from this particular case? Well, look, if it hasn't been obvious, you have to know physiology, both neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, the metabolic, you have to know that stuff in order to be efficient and effective. Look, the less of that stuff that you know, the more inefficient you're gonna be, the more ineffective you'll be. And that's just the way it is. Now, no one expects you to like just know it right off the bat, but that's why we do these walkthroughs. And that's why when we do, when I teach the courses, we go through so many of these cases so that you can understand and really it builds up your experience. It's kind of a cheat to be honest because you get the experience without actually having to see the patient, right? You get to do it in the class. So it's a great way to kind of accelerate your, your kind of your vocabulary, so to speak. So you also want to do testing that makes sense based on that case. Don't, please don't do this. Well, this is the test I do on every new patient. Don't do that. I mean, that's, I mean, you could do it, but I mean, I, I would encourage you to, to not do that. Use those four priorities to prioritize your treatment, right? Always think of what's next. Like I showed you guys, right? Okay, well, she didn't get better. What do I do now, right? You got to know what nutrients, what herbs, et cetera, cause the desired change in the physiology that you want. Okay. And then you must integrate, I think you should integrate brain-based treatment when appropriate and indicated. Cause look, if you don't know how to do rehab, there's only so much you could have done for her, right? You only know what she could do. You could have referred her to somebody else and there's no problem with doing that. You can refer to someone who does know it, but I mean, I don't want to refer her out if I don't have to, I'd like to be able to take care of her, you know, cause I know her case better than anybody. And I don't kind of want to be a one trick pony, to be honest. I mean, I want to kind of do, this is what I want to do, obviously. That's why I do it. So you got to know how to determine if the cause is metabolic and neurochemical, kind of generally speaking, right? You got to know where in the neuraxis the problem is because metabolic problems can create specific neuraxial presentations. You just got to be able to know, work your way through them. What are the symptoms that that patient has telling you? What are they telling you about metabolic possibilities and neuraxis problems? And you got to know how to evaluate not only the metabolic neurochemical stuff, but how to evaluate her neuraxis, which is, a, this is a great example case of doing all of that stuff. And you need to know how to treat effectively and efficiently, right? So with her, we could have wasted a crap load of time treating all kinds of stuff, but we didn't, right? We were specific. We were, had a priority list. We said we had a standard in place. And that's, that's a great example of those systems working together. So that being said, now I can't teach you the rehab because that's way too much to cram into a, a class along with all the neurochemistry and stuff. That's what Fred East can tell you about with the, the CNS series uh, and the RBE series. And that's what all the rehab where you can learn that stuff. But all this metabolic stuff and how to think and the physiology, that's what we're going to be teaching in the newly relaunched neurochemistry modules that'll be starting in October. So I'll be quiet for a second while you <clears throat> say what you want to say. Sure, sure. So the clinical neurochemistry program, which is a program that we did about four years ago, it's being relaunched, which means it's being updated with brand new information because just like neuroscience changes, the neurochemistry, the physiology, we learn more and we want to get you the most updated information. So what's good about this is that 
as we've updated the education, was also updated the way we deliver the education. So everything's going to have a flipped classroom, which means you get to study a little bit so you can actually get more while you're in the classroom. See, what Dr. Clark wants is for you to ask better questions so you could have deeper learning in the room as opposed to just hearing a term for the first time in that classroom. We don't want to explain like, hey, what's methylation? But, you know, maybe if you watch a video on methylation or a... Uh, read a paper on methylation, then you can go, all right, now I understand this pathway a little bit, let's go deeper. And he'll be there to support you, but everything's structured in a way for deep, deep learning. And to help the deep learning, we'll also give you the videos for every module that you go to. So every course uh, is coming out every two to three months. You're gonna get the one that you attend, whether you do live stream or on site, before you attend the next one. So you have a chance to review that material. And that's cool, and by then, the way. Yeah, helps out a lot. And one of the best things, again, is as we plan to update this program every three, uh, three years or so, once you're in this program, you've actually bought a lifetime of education because you will get the updated materials three years later as well. We actually want you in the room uh, so we know that you are being current with the information so that you say when you're a caricatured scholar, you have the latest uh, concepts in your head so you can do the right things for your patient and you actually get to support the other people in the room to make a really good collective learning experience. So we've put a lot of thought into how we're structuring things along with attracting what I think is an excellent professor at this stuff, which I think also goes, also goes a long way, doesn't it, Dr. Clark? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my only closing remark is that, you know, I've, I've changed how I'm gonna teach the class. I mean, I'm, I'm excited about my own kind of pedagogical changes. Uh, I'm excited that you guys will have the videos to watch before the next module begins. You'll have a, a, a true flipped classroom to be able to become immersed and familiar with the language so that we don't have to waste time as Freddie said, going over basic stuff, we can get into the using of it. And then the thing they're doing, which is, I don't know, if, I'm just to make sure everyone hears this, when you, you know, invest in these classes, you get to go to the next time we do them with the new update, you get to go to those too. And they don't charge you anything else, <laughs> which is like totally cool. It's like getting a graduate education for free every four years. You know, like that's we basically you, what it's like. We want you there. Yeah. So, so right. hopefully we, we invite you guys to join us. Dr. Clark, I want to make one more comment. Um, the I like this case, and this is why I like this case. Earlier this morning, I was recording a, a short webinar for a state association. And in that webinar, I was talking about the bottom-up approach to helping people. So that may be things like manual therapies, uh, stretching, strengthening, uh, active passive rehab. And then I was also teaching them about a top-down approach, which means, hey, sometimes we're going to tackle their brain because the brain is the, you know, your nervous system is the governing system to your body. It affects mm -hmm. everything underneath it. And guess what's underneath it? Everything. Uh, what I like about what you're talking about is also an inside out approach, mm, right? So in this in this case, if people are really paying attention, you really you could hear your thought process. You're going, okay, what am I going to do from the bottom up? What can I do from the top down, which you had to do for this patient, but mm -hmm. you also had enough wisdom because it's part of your expertise to know that you had to help them inside out before the top down could really take hold and deliver what you could for this patient and having that capability of knowing which model to use at the right time is incredibly powerful. If you can't be as well studied as Dr. Carrick, I mean, uh, Dr. Carrick or Dr. Clark and do, you know, do them all, you at least should have the appropriate team and have enough education to know when to use which one you owe it mm -hmm. to yourself, you owe yeah. it to your patients. I think that matters. And that's what we're hoping to inspire you to achieve. Yeah. I think we'll do it. All right, Dr. Clark, thank you cool. again. Let's do this again. I know everybody loves these, uh, especially on I YouTube. I got more. So. I got yeah, more I, whenever. I know. <laughs> All right. Awesome, Dr. Clark. Have a great day. Goodbye, everybody. See you. Bye-bye.